Okay, so we've learned that if we add a function to the back end of a sinusoidal function, where we would normally find the midline, we can bend our function. So hopefully it won't surprise you too much to know that if we have got a function in the spot where we would normally have the amplitude, we're going to see a changing amplitude. And here are some examples. So if I have got my function multiplied by a linear function, what we'll see is that my amplitude is linear. In other words, the further out I get from the origin, the bigger my amplitude gets. One way to think of this is the function will bounce back and forth between y equals mt plus b and y equals negative mt plus b. These two lines are not perpendicular. They're the same line. They just have opposite slopes. Think about why. Okay. The same thing is true with an exponential. So if we have got an exponential function multiplied by my sine, then my sine function is going to bounce between y equals a b to the t power and y equals negative a b to the t power. And these are just three examples. You can have a quadratic, really. You can have pretty much any function here that makes sense. The ones that, really any function, truth be told, um, the ones that we're going to see most frequently are going to be linear and exponential. And then we're going to talk about what happens when we've actually got another sinusoidal function as our amplitude function. So let's take a look at an example, and I'm actually going to use a simulation here just to kind of set the stage. So this is um, a site of a whole bunch uh, that includes a whole bunch of simulations out of the University of Colorado. And it's called FET, P-H-E-T. And the one I want is actually this one. Okay. So I want to talk to you about springs and how they work. Hmm. So if I put a weight on a spring, you know it stretches and it bounces, right? And it bounces some amount. So I can actually make it stop, maybe? Nope. So this is its resting position. It's bouncing up and down, right? Now, this doesn't account for friction, and so it's never going to stop bouncing. And I needed the other simulation, actually. I want... There were two here. I want this one. I don't want the new one. Yes, this is what I want. Okay, so ignore that. We don't care about that right now. That's for a different class. Go away. Fine. See what's happening? Watch what happens. If I pull this down over time, my spring slows down. So that's what's called damping. It's because of friction. So if I... I've got no friction, then my spring will just bounce forever. And this is the situation we've worked with until now. All right. If, however, 
I have got a real world situation where I've got some friction. Notice what's happening. My spring bounces less and less with time. And this is much closer to a real world situation. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So let's suppose I've got, well, let me just go grab this out of the textbook. So I've got a spring and my example is going to give me the spring's natural length. Now, what is the spring's natural length? Well, that's the length of the spring before we put a weight on it. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull that spring out six feet and then release it and it's going to oscillate. Now, we did this before with a cart and I had a cute little moving Desmos graph, right? This is pretty much that same situation except our amplitude is decreasing by 20% each second. So let's start with the basic. Okay, let's start with just the spring and we'll worry about the decreasing amplitude in a minute. So let's remember how we do this. My spring starts stretched an extra six feet. So my amplitude at time zero is six. And we know my spring stretches out, so I'm going to use a cosine function because we start at a maximum. Let's talk about my period. We oscillate once every two seconds, which means my period is two. And so my internal multiplier is two pi divided by that observed period, which means pi. So, and I've got a beginning natural length. Huh, it doesn't give it to me. There's a typo in the textbook. This is a natural length of 20 feet. So my midline is around that natural length. So what do I know? I know my function is going to look like some amplitude, and we're going to come to that in a second, times a cosine of pi t plus 20. Now, just a minute ago, I did an example where we increased by so much each period or each partial period. It was, it was elk increased elk population increased by four percent per year this time what we have is an amplitude decreasing by 20 percent each second so when time is zero my amplitude starts at six right at one my amplitude is that six minus 20 percent of what it was before which is 0.8 times 6, right? When time is 2, I take that 0.8 times 6, right? And I multiply it by another 80% to get my 20% decrease. So I end up with 6 times 0.8 squared. And if I follow that pattern on down, my amplitude becomes my starting amplitude times 0.8 to the t pattern. And in fact, the function that describes the movement, the oscillation of my spring, is 6 times 0.8 to the t power times the cosine of pi t plus 20. And if we put that in Desmos, y equals 6 times the cosine of pi x. Not 6, is it? That's 6 times 0 0.8 
to the x power plus 20. And we can see that my spring starts up here at 26 and then it oscillates until it slowly levels out. Okay. All right, and you can do this same sort of work if your amplitude is a linear function or if your amplitude is given to you in a different way. And there are a couple of examples of this in your textbook and a couple of examples embedded in some of the other videos on your homework. I want to talk to you a little bit about radio waves. This is, this is interesting. So you all know about FM radio, which is frequency modulated radio. And the frequency is the inverse of the period of a sinusoidal function. So you can think about what that might mean. We can also have AM radio, which is, so in radio, AM stands for amplitude modulated. And what we do is we use a carrier wave with a high frequency to transmit the signal by applying the to be transmitted signal as the amplitude of the carrier wave. So in other words, if I've got a carrier wave, so let's just think about a single note, a single, okay. So we've got a note with a frequency one hundred and ten cycles per second or hertz. Hertz equals cycles per second. Okay. And we're going to carry this on a carrier wave. It has a frequency of 2 kilohertz, which means 2,000 cycles per second. Okay? Now the note, the musical note, has got a decent amplitude. It's got an amplitude of three. And we're gonna write a function that describes this broadcast wave. So all the electronics in your radio actually know this and they disassemble these waves is what they do. Okay, a couple things we need to know. We need to know the frequency is one over the period. So let's work on just the carrier wave for a minute. The carrier wave has got a frequency of two kilohertz. 2,000 cycles per second, which means that it's got a period of one second per two, one over 2,000. So one over two thousandths of a second. Okay. Which means then, remember that our internal multiplier is 2 pi divided by 1 over the period, divided by the period, which turns out to be 
4,000 pi, which means that my carrier wave has got the form sine of 4,000 pi t. Now what we do is we apply the to be transmitted signal as a amplitude modulator. So let's talk about our note. So our musical note, our transmitted note. Well, it's got an amplitude of three, right? It's got a frequency of 110 cycles per second. Means that my period for my transmitted wave is one over 110, which means that my B, my internal multiplier, is 2 pi divided by 1 over 110, which is 220 pi. So my transmitted note has got the form three sine 220 pi t. And a note on sine versus cosine, you can use either one, it's completely arbitrary. The only difference between sine and cosine is where we cross the x-axis, so it kind of kind of depends on when you start your stopwatch, right? Okay, so this function is my amplitude function for my transmitted wave. So, so my signal wave, the signal that my antenna receives, looks like 3 times the sine of 220 pi t times the sine of 4,000 pi t. So what in the heck does a graph of this look like? Well, let me just show you. It looks like this. If you know any ham radio operators in your life, they will go nuts with this. Okay, so let's talk about what we've got going on here. The blue, highly, quickly oscillating thing in here is the carrier wave. It is the one that is bouncing in between the modulator wave. So this red thing here is the transmitted note. So the outer function gives you your amplitude function, and the inner function gives you the carrier wave. All right. I hope you found that interesting. That is all there is in this section, and I'm going to let you get to solving some problems. Have fun.